thank you for joining us today, Nicola, for these uh, questions, and thank you for taking time out today with what must be a really busy uh, time for you at the moment. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's absolutely crazy. I bet it has. Um, so what um, inspired you to take part in All The Glitters? Um, so I was actually forwarded the casting email from a friend who I'd been um, working alongside, another jeweller. Um, and I instantly passed it off. I just, I sent it on to other people that were, uh, like my eyes, better makers. Um, and then a friend of mine, Annie, um, Annie McKay Jewelry, she's amazing, so gifted. Um, and she said, well, why don't you go for it? I don't want to go, on, I don't want to go on television and be filmed, but why don't you go for it? And I, was, I said, I'm not, I'm not technically able enough to do that. Um, but she said, what, what are you going to lose? They're just going to say no at the worst thing. So I thought about it for a couple of days and then at 11 o'clock at night, I kind of, on a whim, just thought, why not? And was led in bed and typed it on my phone and sent the application off. And then here we are. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing, isn't it? Amazing. So, so tell me, the, the, the three hour limit um, for the first project, the bangles, you know, everybody I think gasped when they said, you've got to make these three bangles in three hours and yeah that is tough for anybody so how did you manage to plan to make your bangles and not just the bangles but all the items you've made within the time frame that they allow yeah that's really hard for me to answer because i'm not very good at timekeeping in any area of my life um if i manage to be on time for work then that's like my box is ticked <laughs> but um, so with the bangles, I just tried to kind of think, how can I gear the finishes to require less time? Because full on polishing, I mean, you could spend hours polishing. Um, and so I just, I tried to tweak the designs so that I know, I knew what I was doing for some of them. Uh, like one of them's textured all the way around which helped with the finishing and 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 so that was kind of a, a shortcut for me um but I still I still wasn't really finished <laughs> they looked all right but yeah they, were, they weren't as finished as I would have liked them but yeah three hours is short but it was good the fact that you thought about the finish and how long that would take you and then you could concentrate then on the construction, not having to worry about, well, I've got to spend an hour polishing. Well, yeah, because the other thing is there was an extra challenge that I don't know if people noticed, but we had to start from a solid sheet. Yes. There was no guillotine. So we either had to pierce or snip. Obviously snipping was faster, but then you get the rough edges. Um, and I, I, I wouldn't normally start that way. I would either buy the sheet in the correct size or I'd use wire um, probably for my style um so yeah there was like an extra layer of challenge on top because you just wouldn't start that way exactly no you did very well very very well indeed mm. um how did kintsugi um become an inspiration for you so i first um discovered the theory of kintsugi in my final year of university i had got married because I don't do anything simply between my second and third year of university and we spent our honeymoon in New Zealand which was incredible and we were traveling around and I realized that I was taking more and more photographs of um, agricultural utilitarian functional buildings and I didn't know what was drawing me to them but I decided it was probably on an artistic level rather than a let's capture our honeymoon level and so I decided to be really intentional about how I was taking the photos, framing them in a certain angle. I really liked them dead on. And, and so that's where my interest of value started. So when I got back to university, I laid all these images out and um, I just sat down and I was like, well, what's this? Why, why has this interested me? And not only did I really love the form and the shape and the line of architecture, um, 
but I loved that these spaces were so necessary and so valuable, yet weren't valued. And then we've got like high-end architecture and, and I started making stuff in precious metals, which are really valued, but they're not necessary. And it had this contrast, this juxtaposition. And uh, I, I was just researching ideas around value. And that's when I, I fell into Kintsugi, which is about how you, something can be more precious for having been on a journey, even if it's been broken. And I think that's such a, there's such a spiritual connect, like a personal connection to that. I think people can really resonate with that idea um, because we've all been on a journey, haven't we? We've all had our own breakages. Yeah. And so it's, um, it's such a beautiful philosophy. Mm, and something people can identify with, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And, it, and it's great how you're relating that to the jewellery as well. Mm, very clever. Which, which, is, which is very good. Very clever indeed. So tell me now, if you had a chance to complete the challenges that you've completed so far, would you do anything differently? Yes, I wouldn't enamel. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, I would enamel, but I'd give myself more time and I'd wet pack. But um, uh, so I, <laughs> I've learned so much from these challenges. I would do something different in all of them, to be honest. Um, but yeah, I cringe when I think about it. I've lost so much sleep. <laughs> <laughs> actually seeing it on television is so much kinder than I am to my in my head but um uh if I was to go back I think the biggest thing I would change is stepping away I would give myself more time to breathe and that flow to think is this the right choice for this piece what should I does this fit the brief because also it is a challenge like you've got a yeah boxes so um what the mistakes I made were when I just was not thinking I was just doing and getting it done um and so if if I had stepped back um, it would have looked really counterproductive but I think actually I wouldn't have made mistakes like using uh, it was translucent enamel powder that I accidentally I didn't have a base for it and you know things that I know I, I know I could have done better but um but in the heat of the moment you have to get it done don't you yeah what made you interested in making jewelry and pursuing this as a career so my background originally was textiles and illustration um I actually enrolled on a textile degree very quickly it became apparent that uh it wasn't the industry I wanted to work in and I moved over to a contemporary design crafts course. And that in Hereford is um, a general designer maker course. So you get inducted in all of the different kinds of crafts. So like pottery, printmaking, uh, small metals. And um, there was something about working in metal that caught me. But I have to say initially, I was still very um illustrative with it so I one of the first things I ever made actually was bird health and safety equipment which is um I made like a little aviator goggles and hat for a, a pigeon <laughs> it's just, just you know yeah. uh, I, I'd love to see them <laughs> um but uh then I <laughs> that was so much fun and then I moved on to another project and actually I've posted about this on my social media which is um funny that it's come up twice um I started looking into a project about memory and specifically memory loss my um my dad passed away from Alzheimer's and my grandmother had uh, vascular dementia oh I'm sorry uh thank you I've had a it's just been a massive part of my life. My dad was diagnosed when I was 14. Wow. Um, so I guess in a way I was using that to process some of the emotion because he, he was actually still alive at this point. I was making this project. And I was 
looking into layers of memory and using text and it's very much an artist based project but I ended up using jewellery as my vessel to express the ideas yeah. and I've, I've just never left jewellery it it just caught me I, I love that it's wearable art it's art you take with you and um <laughs> it's so interesting it's more than just thinking well for me I'm very design and concept led idea led and it's it's more than just thinking okay I'll make a ring today um if someone comes to me with a, a commission I love to mix my innate style with meaning like real story real narrative so that it's actually impactful and has a concept um and I think jewelry is really re unique in that way you wouldn't just carry a painting around or a sculpture around with you and it's yeah it's something that is portable communication um it's so it's so so interesting so as soon as I found um yeah, as soon as I found jewellery as a vessel for my ideas, I, I haven't looked back and um, I would love, I'm not a full-time maker at the moment, but I would love to be in the future, so. What impact do you think the show will have on the industry as a whole? I'm really hoping that the show um, highlights the industry. Uh, I think this is true for many crafts, but because of mass production and high street brands, the price difference, unless you're someone who values arts and crafts anyway, and has that like leaning, you're not necessarily going to understand why the same or a similar product is so much different in price. Um, and hopefully this exposure will start a conversation with a wider community um, talking about the value of things. I think also it's come at a really interesting time socially because of the pandemic. There has been an increase of people wanting to support um, small business or independent business and also a real stripping back of what is important. Why do I buy? Like what, what am I engaging with when I consume a product and I, I think as independent makers and parts of the trade because it's not necessarily one person does all um, you have a chance to be really transparent and really um, communicate that to your consumer and I think now had this had this show come out in 2020 or had, uh, had the pandemic not happened, I wonder whether there would have been quite such an appetite or an interest. I really do think the pandemic has obviously been awful for so many people and it's been tragic, but what it has done is forced us to stop and reevaluate. Oh, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. And I think that that is reflecting in buying trends and um, hopefully, hopefully we can use that and it can be highlighted how how much is involved in making and it's not that it's just even a piece but it's a person yeah I, I, I love the jewelry trade I really do I know I'm biased but so in terms of working in an unfamiliar environment um, what challenges if any did you did you find you came up against um so when you're working in your space that you're used to, I think you've got a good, you've got a bit of muscle memory. You know where everything is. Um, my space is tiny, as you can see, so everything is pretty much within arm's reach. <laughs> um, so, like driving someone else's car, you know, oh. when you're like trying to shift the gears and and you're like, okay, there's the biting point. Um, yeah, uh, so that took some getting used to, and also. <laughs> one of the biggest things was there was no music and <laughs> I listen to music when I make or an audiobook or yeah I I don't make in silence so that that was a challenge for me um in terms of tools I can't really 
fault the tools that they gave us. They were amazing. Um, that torch was divine. Look, this is what I use, genuinely. So the tool I absolutely loved. Um, I was like a kid in a sweet shop, really. Uh, but yeah, probably the, the no music was the biggest thing. <laughs> so we're talking the tools. What tool can you not manage without? That's really hard because it depends on what I, I'm making. But I probably would say the tool I use the most, and it's really simple, are my parallel pliers. But because I do a lot of angular work, a lot of linear work with straight, straight lines, because they're parallel, I don't get that marking from, from normal pliers. Yeah. So, yeah, I always have these to hand. Um, so I think that's probably my favourite. Which technique would you most like to be asked to demonstrate? And what would be the one that you would least like to be asked to demonstrate? Mm, so I am actually a silversmithing tutor at the local art college. And when I teach them soldering, I love it, which is funny because soldering can be quite a lot of pressure. You don't want to melt things, but I love trying to get my students to visualize the science behind it and the heat flow because the solder won't run to the right places if the heat is unbalanced and so I always talk about building our like thinking about heat bouncing back like a mirror and where you place your piece on the block how well is it supported and and so I find the technique of soldering really really calming to explain to my students and the same with annealing actually talking about the molecules and I I love to teach so yeah I think that I think soldering so what's your worst technique then stone setting <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a setter <laughs> I I I do bezels and si simple settings but I, it's something I would really love to to improve on I'm very, very new at, um, at stone setting, yeah. So you work primarily in silver, but what materials would you like and most want to work with? So I work mainly in silver, but my favorite material to work with is gold, yellow gold. I just think it's so polite, but that's the way it was introduced to me as my, my jewelry tutor at uni was just said, oh, it's so polite. And I didn't really know what she meant until I worked with it and I was like I swear it's got some sort of connection to my brain my <laughs> it just goes where I want it to go and I I love I love yellow gold it's so buttery and rich and when it's polished up or even matted back it's just beautiful yeah um so what was your favorite moment on the show <laughs> I really loved the breaks they um the, <laughs> bits we would let off steam but in terms of in front of the camera I liked um especially by the second episode I think the first episode everyone was a bit nervous but um there was more of a friendship on the floor and um that it didn't get shown actually but at one point Sonny was crossing the room when I was and he was about to polish his chain and he was like does anyone have any goggles and I was wearing them on my head so I just like whip them off and pass them on and we were chatting at the rolling mill a bit more and and that was that was <laughs> yeah that was really lovely um and there was also a sense of relief when you get something on the plinth or the or the stand even if you're not particularly happy with it at least <laughs> there is some sort of sense of crossing the finish line um and and that was that was a real sense of achievement in a way yeah there's been lots of talk recently in the Facebook groups regarding Sean and Solange. They seem stern. Do you think that's a fair appraisal? Obviously, we've got to realise that the workshops are potentially dangerous places. But what are they like in real life? They are actually really personable. Um, I think it's worth remembering that they are makers and designers for Solange at the top of their game like absolute top of their field and 
and not TV personalities as well, um, necessarily. <laughs> um, but also they really know what they're on about. So when they make a criticism, it I don't think there's a personal element in there, not really. I think they are just coming from a place of such experience that it it's purely professional mm. constructive criticism. Yeah. Uh, but that's a difficult thing with with art. I think it's worth thinking about how you would appraise someone without taking into account your personal taste and a personality. And I think that must be really difficult to be a judge and remove those things. And so that is possibly what people are seeing. But off, off screen, they are, they are lovely. So one thing we get asked a lot by aspiring jewellers um, is where do you start? If you want to forge a career in jewellery making or metal smithing, there's so many routes. But so, what would be your advice? This is really interesting. So it totally depends on where you that person's interest is. So are they a technical person and they want to be led by technique and skill, um, or do they want to be led by design? and ideas and concept because they're two different starting points not that they don't interlink but if you have huge amounts of technical skill sometimes that can be not limiting but it can be a hurdle to pass through for design because you're instantly thinking of the things that go wrong yeah. or that inhibit those ideas um so it, it really depends so if you're a design person i would really say find your source inspiration um think about it get excited about it draw it whatever works for you as a creative develop these ideas and think how does that make sense then as a piece of jewelry and then sample and try but then you have to figure out the technical side. So it's quite, it's a funny way into it, but then you end up knowing yourself as an artist and a maker. Um, if you're really interested in the technique, then I would say go to classes, practice at home, just keep trying because you're never gonna get better if you don't start. Um, and there's so much, information on the internet your videos for example to to self-teach and then you can go to a local arts college or something for a course if you if you can afford it and um and build your technique up there and if you want to take it into actually making money off of it then i would say try and find especially for the technique side of things um try and find a job in a jeweler's where you're maybe just doing repairs because yes, you're not doing your own creative work, but you're practicing your skill every day. Uh, okay, so the future. Uh, can you imagine focusing on one particular area of jewelry? Um, and do you think the show has changed your direction in any way? I would love to go and do my master's. So I've got a BA honours in contemporary design. I want to get a master's degree because eventually I would love to be a tutor at HE level. Um, but what I really believe is that the best tutors have life experience. And so first I want to have a business. Um, where the master's fits in, I'm, I'm not entirely sure, but um, I, I very much see myself as an artist jeweler um I love as we've discussed I love concept I love narrative I love knowing why I'm making a piece um and so I would love to do exhibitions and and commissions for people that are really interested in engaging in me as a maker and an artist and and their story and, and making something really cool I think in terms of the show it's given me exposure I've never been so busy um, it, which I think I'm so grateful for because 
it's not been a very long that people have been buying my work because they like my style and this show has just it, it skyrocketed the attention um, which has been so humbling and so exciting and I am a little bit gutted that I'm gonna have to take a, a break to to have a baby but I know that's going to be so exciting in its own right. So thank you so much for taking time today just to, to answer our questions they have been absolutely brilliant really really good yeah. really, really good really good yeah, thank you so much thank you so much indeed you're very well you're so much fun <laughs> and don't forget you can watch bbc 2's all that glitters it airs on tuesday 8 p.m and alternatively you can watch it on iplayer